Cool. So we've got a gauge pod for the one gauge not going in an eyeball vent. We've got an inline sending unit adapter for the heater hose. We've got an oil filter sandwich plate, and we've got a coolant temperature gauge, an oil temperature gauge, and an oil pressure gauge. And we're going to be taking all these parts and stuffing it in this here Miata. Now I realize there's a certain number of you viewers at home that the only reason you're watching this video is because you need to know how to get the eyeball vents out of an NB Miata with a card. This one's a Metro Smart Trip card. You could use a credit card, whatever. So if you look over here, I've already got this one out, and this is how they're retained, is these two little plastic clips. And so what you need to do is get something in there to release and then pull the vent out. So the easiest way is to take your card, slide it between the vent and the dash. You don't want to be shy, you really want to get it in there. And just work it around until you hear it click. There's the click. So that's one side. So it Pull on it a little bit. Try not to turn on the hazards. And then we try to get the other side. There it goes. And out she comes. And that's all there is to it. All right, let's hit the workbench and prep everything else. Let's see. We'll start with the water gauge here. So this is a gauge pod made specifically for a Miata. It's uh, Auto meter, gauge works, part number 20663. I'll put a link in the description below. And so we're just gonna put the water gauge on the pillar. And these are really, really easy because all you gotta do is snap it in. First you gotta get that out of the packaging. And as per the instructions, it is literally just a friction fit. So you just snap it right in. I said you just snap it right in. Yeah, there we go. See, look at that, beautiful, gorgeous, wonderful. And we'll adjust this when we get it into the car so it's actually level with the dash. I wanna say, get close at least, I wanna say it should be like there-ish. I think that's about right. So cool, that's done. Now this is the sending unit for the gauge. It's a uh, 1 8 inch NPT, standard size threading for a uh, sending unit. Uh, and this goes down in the coolant and detects the temperature and sends that information back to the gauge. Now, in a lot of vehicles, what you would normally do is if it had a temperature gauge from the factory, you would put this sending unit in the location of the factory one, and the one on the dash wouldn't work, but you'd have your aftermarket one. Unfortunately, on the Miata, for whatever reason, the uh, Sending unit is 1 8 inch BP to you, British pipe thread. One must not get one's knickers in a twist. Um, which is strange, to say the least. So you could try to rig up an adapter, but from what I understand, it, it won't hold the sending unit into the coolant, and that causes a problem, because you won't actually get an accurate reading. So what you can do is get one of these, and this goes right in the uh, heater hose line. This is auto meter part number 2281. Put a link to that in the description. Um, and this basically, you just put it in line with a heater hose. That gives you a nice 1 8 inch uh, MPT fitting. So this just goes right in there. And then the other thing that's kind of cool about this is it's actually tapped right there. So that then they give you some extra parts here so that you can ground this as well. And I think this might actually be, these, there's two pins on there, so this might actually get its ground from the uh, wiring harness that it comes with. But I'm gonna go ahead and put this on anyway. Unfortunately, the one of these I received, they give you the stud and you're supposed to have a nut that goes right on that. So this slides in and they give you a little wire there and they give you this, uh, this little crimp on 
So you, you see how that goes. But for whatever reason, mine came with the star washer, but no nut. And I don't know if it just fell out or if this was repackaged. I mean, it happens. Um, so what I did is I just found this screw that's exactly the right threading and it's the depth is perfect. I already checked it. Um, unfortunately, it's the devil's fastener as it torques. <laughs> But that's how I'm just going to screw it right in. So we'll take this. This looks like okay stuff. And we'll uh, go ahead and crimp that on. And when you're crimping, I always recommend using Klein style crimpers. These are actual Klein crimpers. Um, because those flat ones that come with like crimping, they're terrible. You want to get the real thing for this type of connector. And what you want to do is, you see there's a seam on that right there. I don't know how well that'll show up on camera. But you want to align it so that the tooth on the crimper is on the opposite side of that because then it, it kind of forces those into the, the die side of the crimper here. And then just crimp. So you got a nice crimp there. That's together. And so we'll just put that on here. And the reason for this is uh, if, if you were, for instance, going to put your sending unit, like if there was a place, or, or for instance, the factory one would be right in the head or the block. Like for instance, on my Eagle, they're right in the head. So you don't actually need to run a separate ground, it's self-grounds. Um, whereas this does not. You know, it's going to be insulated because it's basically going to be attached to the rubber hose. So and then we'll just take this and ground it somewhere on the chassis. You know, wherever's a convenient spot for it. And that'll ensure that this is grounded. Now, like I said, I think that sending unit may actually derive its ground off the harness anyway, so that might not be necessary for this particular temperature sensor or sending unit. But a lot of these don't have like this neat clip-in style. A lot of them are just a, you know, a bolt that you would put then something like that on, and then that goes up to the gauge and then it gets its power and ground from elsewhere. So yeah, now we gotta put that in. So you could probably do this with Teflon tape, but I'm gonna go ahead and use some Permatex high temperature thread sealant. Part number 59214. Put a link for that down in the description below as well. Uh, we'll just go ahead. So you gotta cut that open. Go ahead and knead that a little bit. There we go. Just apply a little bit more liberally, it looks like. Uh, and you want to make sure you don't do exactly what I just did there. Get any on the sensor itself. Make sure that's clean. Alright. And this, I believe, will stop once it's far enough in. Yep, decent amount of resistance there. And you can see it only, it, it doesn't really obstruct the flow that much. And you still get plenty past it. And the sensor itself is down into the, uh, down into the uh, flow of the coolant there. So there we have it. So that is our coolant sending unit. Right, and here's the harness for it, so it looks like I was probably wrong. I'm assuming we do need that ground, because if you look here, this is what comes out to the sending unit, so this is what you would route, or we're gonna route, through
through the uh, firewall into the engine bay. Um, and I was thinking maybe, you know, two conductors, one of them black, maybe that's, that's grabbing ground from somewhere else. But if you look here, your red and black are your power and ground for actually giving the gauge itself power. And this is going into a completely different pin. So probably necessary to go ahead and ground that, uh, that inline adapter. So glad I did. And then yeah, these two just hook up to power and ground. And these two are for data logging. So supposedly that's it. I mean, this goes to the sending unit, this goes to power and ground. This plugs right into the back of the gauge. Pretty simple. Okay, now for the oil gauges, both oil temperature and pressure, putting them in the uh, eyeball locations. Um, so this is the kind of final result of that. I did this one already. Uh, and this just will click right into the factory location for the eyeball vent. Uh, you got plenty of room to make your hookups and everything there. So what you have to do is take this apart. And then interestingly enough, these gauges are actually friction fit. However, I'm a little bit worried about this particular gauge because this is one of these slim ones. And I'm not sure it's gonna have enough meat to actually snap into place. See, there's very little material there to actually make the friction fit. Now it worked fine for the water gauge the water temp gauge, because this is actually made for that. These have a little bit of a bevel to them. So I'm not 100% sure that that's just gonna pop right in the way this one did. And you can see there's a, a lot of meat to that and that just dropped right in there. Um, well, it takes a little bit of force, but that's the idea, because it's not coming out. So we might have to do a little MacGyvering on that. Now to get these apart, you can see there's little clips around the outside here and basically you have to get those to release and then this ring comes out in fact I have the disassembled one right here this pops right out and then these are two separate pieces um, so you got to separate them get that out and then put this ring back in and then this drops into the ring pretty simple but what I may end up doing and we'll see is if this ends up not being you know, a good friction fit because of that bevel, I can get a little more material to work with by taking the uh, supplied adapter here and maybe just shaving it down until it's just the right size. So we'll see if I have to do that. I'm just gonna gotta get this off with Mr. Pokey Tool. Oh, there we are. So that's ready to go. So these are kind of tricky. And the best thing to do is just try one, work around, go to the next. Try one, work around, go to the next. Oh, there we go, that one popped right out. That one doesn't want to let go yet. That one moved a little. That one came out real easy. There we go. There we go. That one didn't release. Flew away. <laughs> All right, so there we are. That's the ring. The vent comes out. And incidentally, if you, uh, if you were wanting to fix the droopy vent problem that happens on a lot of these, this is what fails right here. It's the foam. Probably just replace that with some more foam tape and that would solve the problem. But we're putting in gauges, and actually, foam on these is good. This one wasn't drooping at all. So let's see. See if we'll get, yeah, that's what I was worried about. Although I wonder, that might actually work. And then we'll snap that piece in all together. All right, yeah, that looks like it's totally gonna work. All right, yeah, that should clear. And so then we wanna line this up so that these indents here 
bar straight with the gauge face so lined up with that notch there, see? So that way when it goes in, it locks right in and it's in the orientation that we want it. Because we don't want to have to pull it back out afterwards. Let's line it up just about right. Let's see if we can snap it back in place. Oh, we can still adjust this after the fact. That's handy. Couldn't do that on the other one. Had to go off camera where I had a harder countertop because this is carpet. But yeah, had to give it a little bit of pressure so that these would lock in. Now I think if I sort of tighten these after the fact, which I can get my finger in there and do. Yep, locked in place. Cool. So there you have it. That's our oil temperature and our oil pressure, and those are going to go in the eyeball vents. Okay, so here are the sending units for the pressure gauge and the oil temperature gauge. It actually looks like it is probably the exact same sending unit as what comes with the water temperature gauge. Actually, come to think of it, they might be like the same part. So to install those, we've got this oil filter sandwich plate, and the way this works is it actually goes right onto the stud that holds your oil filter. And you get this little adapter here. That then screws onto the stud. It's threaded female on the inside there. So that screws onto the stud where the oil filter normally would go. And then the oil filter attaches here. What's nice about that is it gives you three different places that you could add sending units uh, or Guys with turbos use these to add um, oil feeds for the turbos, um, but we're just going to do the sending units here. So I'm thinking the best way to do this is probably to go ahead, just based on the way that it is on the Miata block. Uh, there's not a lot of room around there. It's, uh, it's a little bit hard to get to, but I'm thinking there's more room towards the back, because the alternator is about right here. So I think I'm going to want to hang these off the back, and I'm thinking I want this in the bottom position. So I'm going to use these two with the temperature at the top and the pressure at the bottom, just because the pressure is a little bit bulkier. Now I am also, you can see these are uh, Teflon taped in. I'm going to go ahead and coat this with some more of this liquid thread sealant because I trust it more. I think it'll do a better job. So I'll go ahead and take this plug back out, out but I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it right back in. Oh, that, that was loose too. Really loose. So I'm glad I did that. And of course, I will put a link to this uh, sandwich plate in the description below. And this actually works on a number of different vehicles, not just the Miata. In fact, it even comes with um, an SAE adapter. This one's got the correct threads, but this one fits some other applications, I suppose. So it's, uh, if you look on the Amazon listing, it's actually got a, uh, in the questions and answers, I think it's, I saw it, a list of different applications that this works for. So you can check that out. See if it'll work on your car, even if you don't have the auto in there. Trying to do the same thing. Make sure there's a good coating. Bigger the gob, better the job. There we go. I don't like leaks. I don't. Who does? Especially oil leaks. Makes a mess. Of course, every car I own is a customer's. Every car I own likes to mark its territory, but that's because I, for some reason, only own old 4x4s. The two ports that we're actually going to use for our uh, sending units are held in by these uh, Allen bolts. So we'll go ahead and take those. That was real loose too, so if you're going to do this, you know, you're planning on keeping the factory Teflon tape, which, you know, should be fine. Um, just make sure you tighten these in a bit. These were really loose. The gasket on that side, so that's what's that's the side that's gonna go towards the block. Alternator here, temperature, pressure. So I'm gonna go ahead. And put that one 
here. Try not to get it in the sensor. Ideally. like an oil drain plug or even oil filter itself you don't really want to reef on it because if you go too far you'll strip it out or at least you know spread the threads and then it won't seal that well you want to be you want to get it in there obviously you don't want it falling out but you also don't want to really go nuts on it and Gorilla Man. <laughs> All right, that feels good. So we'll go ahead and get that on the car. Okay, so you're not really going to be able to see a lot of this because of where the oil filter is on a Miata. It is the, the 1.8 BP, really. It was designed to go the other way in front wheel drive cars. So when they put it in the Miata, the uh, the oil filter unfortunately ended up in a kind of hard to get to location. But if you come down here, I don't know how good of a shot you can get of that, but I've got a yellow shop towel down under there to catch the oil that's gonna come out when I, when I pull the filter. And then how this is gonna work is we've got our standoff here that's gonna go in here. See, it's threaded just like an oil filter. That's gonna go right in there. Oh, this is backwards. It's gonna go right in there like that. And then the new oil filter's gonna go over top of it. So that's how that's gonna go. And it's so tight in there, my plan is to hopefully just clock this to wherever it fits before tightening it down. And the best way to get an oil filter off of a Miata is to just stick your hand in there and unscrew it. I don't know why everybody makes a big deal out of it. Just kidding, I'm just very lucky that this one's already loose. Try to get it out right side up and not make a mess. Try the operative word. So there's that. Fun fact, Wix makes Napa Golds, so these are the same filter, effectively. Actually, I didn't spill too much. I did a good job at that. <laughs> so as difficult as these sendings units are to get to, or will be, once that sandwich plate is installed, I decided I'm actually going to go ahead and plug them in before I install the sandwich plate. And then on top of that, I'm actually going to, these are the harnesses for the two oil pressure gauges. You see there's a lot going on here. Um, and these connectors are fairly big. That's the one for the uh, temperature, that's the one for the oil pressure. So in order to make it easier to feed them through the firewall grommet, I'm actually going to go ahead and cut them and then rejoin them, uh, solder and heat shrink them in the car once I'm uh, done running the wires. That'll make it a thousand times easier to get them through the firewall. It's very important that you leave enough to solder to. So I'm just going to do it right there. Give myself a good bit of clearance. So the worst thing you can do is chop it right at the connector. This one's actually got three conductors. More used to the analog gauges that just have you connect a single wire. That of course is super simple to feed through the firewall. These will be really easy to reconnect afterward. All right, so now that I've cut these off and I have my pigtails, I'm gonna go ahead and connect them. I'm just doing this because it would be so, so much harder to add the extra step of putting these on 
after I've installed the sandwich plate, just because of where this is on this car. It is not easy to get to. So if the video cuts out right now, it's because I just started cursing and screaming. That is not easy. Post extenders going on. And then make sure that, that is snug against the block before I get in there with a wrench and torque it down. Yeah, that looks good. I'm gonna put a wrench on that. And there's some say in the comments, why didn't you just take the wheel off and go through the wheel? And that somebody would be 110% correct. There ended up being some sort of schnoo on the oil filter mounting surface that I couldn't see from the top. So I got to take it all apart and do it again. To do this, you simply turn the steering wheel all the way left, put it on jack stands, pop the wheel off. I still found it easiest to feed tools in from the top, but being able to actually see what I was doing made it much, much easier. And of course, it means I got to get this footage of course, it didn't really help me that much with the torque wrench part. I still had to do that from the top, and my knuckles are still healing. It is important that it's pretty tight. Mishimoto says 35 foot-pounds, because you want it to be tight enough that this is not going to back your whole assembly out. Lubricate the gasket there. Go ahead and slide this guy on. Hopefully it still fits. But, oh, it fits. Barely. God, that's close clearance. As with any oil filter, you want to just make sure it's on tight, but I wouldn't put a tool on it to tighten it down. So moving on to the coolant sending unit. There it is. So the plan is to go ahead and put it in the heater ho or heater core line. Unfortunately, it's got to be the one on the left here because that one's the inlet that brings the hot water from the engine to the heater core. This nice, easy to get to one is the outlet. And that would mess up our readings because if you turned on the heat, well, the heater's acting like a radiator and it's cooling it off. This is about the hottest point on this engine because uh, of the way the coolant system works on it. So I haven't drained the cooling coolant system because in my experience, there's really no way to do this without making a big mess. Even if you drain it, it's it's still going to go everywhere. Um, so I've jammed a bunch of shop towels down in there, and I'm just going to try to do this kind of quickly. You know, pop this in there, pop it in there on the other side, and then we'll put our hose clamps on. So we're going to cut it such that we can get the barb in on each side with a little space. I'm just going to put it right up in here on the top. And, uh, yeah so that if you're going to do something stupid like this, not to have your dogs around. They really like the taste of coolant, and you don't want them to drink it because it'll kill them. I wonder if I can pinch this off. Here comes the mess. And yeah, I'm aware that I'm using pruning shears for this, and they do make dedicated hose cutting tools, but these are these awesome Fiskars ones that have some sort of extra leverage thing on them and they're just plain awesome for tight locations. Yeah, there it goes. That's actually not that bad. So, if you can get this one, this is where most of it is, if you can get this one kind of vertical, it'll stop spilling. So let's go ahead and get this guy shoved in there. Should fit like a glove. And you know, I could have put my hose clamp on already. But like I said, I'm trying to do this quick so that I don't spill coolant everywhere. You really want to get this to snug right up against the edge. But it's fighting me. There we go. 
clamps are always a lot of fun to put back on after you've completely taken them off like I did here. But, through the magic of editing, they're on. So next, you gotta hook up that ground wire. If you look down in here, you can see that right on this panel right here, there's actually a factory ground going to the block, ground strap. So that means this is gonna be a really good place to ground to. And then about two inches up from it, there is actually a tapped and threaded hole already there. And I've checked and it appears to be an M6 hole. So I have here an M6 bolt and a star washer and a ring terminal. So we'll take this. How long does it really need to be? Cut it about there. And then we will strip that. We'll put our ring terminal on. Just like on the other side, we want to make sure the tooth is away from the seam. Give that a nice crimp. Take our bolt and our star washer. Star washer goes on the side towards the chassis. Put that in there. And then we'll attempt to screw it in. Here we go. So now we've got all of our sending units where they're gonna be. And we've got these wires for each that I cut off of those main harnesses. We gotta get these through the firewall into the cabin so that we can hook them up to the gauges. Some of these I'm probably gonna have to extend too. Yeah, that's kind of short. So we might be adding wire to these, uh, so the two oil ones in order to get them where we need to get them. So my favorite way to go through the firewall is uh, find a large grommet that already has wiring in it and then take a coat hanger and pop it through. Uh, there are tools for this. I have found the coat hanger works better than the actual grommet tool made for it. Um, I usually, some people sharpen them, some installers. I just leave it with the blunt cut because that's sharp enough for me to pop through the grommet, but it's also you know, kind of a safety measure in case I run into something I'm not supposed to. That way you're not putting holes in things you don't need to. You kind of got to really need it. So all I do, and this seems like really thick wire because it's got this jacket on it, but this works with like four gauge amplifier power wire. So this should work no problem. We get your electrical tape. Get these all together. Put it part way up the coat hanger. And then you really want to tape it tight. And I usually go ahead and do two rounds. And get it up to up to the top there. And then come back down. And the most important part of this, and honestly the most important part of applying electrical tape anywhere, is that you give it a bit of stretch so it's good and tight. Because the adhesive isn't really that strong, but the tension caused by the vinyl stretching helps. And I fold it over like that so that I can peel this back off once I've got it where I need it. So where this is going, a lot of cars. You'll find a nice big fat grommet in the firewall where most of the vehicle wiring goes through. And so we're gonna pop a hole in that uh, and add our wiring. So I've already looked at it inside. Let's see if it'll play nice for us. There we go, and we're through. And then we're gonna take some WD-40 lubricated a little bit and I'm actually gonna pop inside the vehicle real quick and make sure that's coming out where I want it to. Inside the cabin, pull it through.
Now, as you can see, I had very, very little slack left to work with on these, so I did, in fact, have to uh, solder on some primary wire to extend them. So that actually worked out really well that I ended up cutting them like that. Uh, I don't have any footage of that, unfortunately, because it was already pretty tight quarters under there, but I had to extend them long enough to get here. This is my other favorite tool, second only to the coat hanger. This is just a zip tie that I cut the end off of, a really big zip tie, and I use it to fish wires. So we want to get, actually, yeah, we'll go from there. This is the radio dash opening. And actually, this is where I'm going to go ahead and grab power for the, uh, for the gauges right off of this. This isn't bad for a home gamer, but I'll probably redo that for him just because so well, it's one of those things where if you touch it, you're kind of responsible for it. So I'm just going to shove this back through here. Actually, there is plenty of room to work with there. Some cars, it's kind of a nightmare, but this, surprisingly, for such a little car, is pretty easy. And I'll run this when I want to run it. I avoid moving parts, obviously. I usually just try to sewing machine through existing wiring harnesses. And these are the newly extended cables that I made. I'll just tape these off. Nice and easy, I presume. There we go. Make sure that I didn't do anything dumb. Make sure it is away from all moving parts. And it is. And I uh, made these actually considerably longer than they need to be. So, pressure's gonna go here. Temperature's gonna go here. And then I've already run this one up the side here for the water temperature gauge. Didn't have to extend that one, that was pretty easy. And honestly, I didn't even film it because it was just, all you gotta do is tuck it right in beside there. Not really much to it. It's not rocket appliances. So next we gotta get power and ground. Yeah, I'm just gonna cut into his stereo wiring here. And I'll clean it up for him while I'm at it. A primary wire here. Don't need much. Side into that. Get a piece of heat shrink tube. Get a nice little lineman splice here. <laughs> off of all of the other gauges, harnesses, and put them in this and crimp it down. So I'm going to go ahead and run this harness, which is going to connect to this, down the same way I did this. Just tuck it into the pillar, so that's where that gauge is going to go. Give it a little extra slack. Really, you don't have to do much to get this in there. It just tucks right in. And then, I'm actually probably just going to go ahead and fish this. Without a tape. Wedge it down behind the weather strip. That should reach. I shouldn't have to extend that. And once again, I'm just sewing machining behind existing wiring harnesses up here. Oh yeah, I can totally do this without a fish tape. I did it the hard way before. Uh, I wanted to show off my zip tie. I'm really proud of it. Alright. So we're going to grab power for this, same place as these two, which is right here at the radio. Okay, so we're just going to run this right here. And then this right here. Da, da, 
Go ahead and zip tie these together just so I don't lose them. Yeah, yeah, I know they're not flush cutters. Sue me. At least I'm not making little daggers. So we're gonna go ahead and take our sending unit wires and reconnect them. Yeah. And yeah. For lineman's places. The 16 gauge primary wire was probably complete overkill, but it's what I had in the right colors. And get our shrinky dinks for grown ups. Go ahead and put some gauges in. Go ahead and clip in these harnesses. And this should click it. Beautiful. That looks factory. I'm do the same thing on this one. Put this bad boy in. Click. That one didn't make as satisfying of a click, but it's in there. All right, so that's good. We've got plenty of room on those wires. And now I can take these. And you know, there's a lot of extra here. The slack is a good thing. So I think what I'll do is actually zip tie it here. But yeah, I mean, neatness really is key. Because if something goes wrong and you pull it apart and there's just a giant ball of spaghetti, like a big mess of spaghetti, you don't know where to start, but you can tell that that wasn't done right. Now, if this wasn't working, and, you know, it's like nice and neat and clean, A, you can troubleshoot it better, and B, you can tell whoever did it, you know, actually did a good job. So you tend to narrow your focus to the equipment rather than the install, and you'd probably be right because a clean install. It's probably the product that went bad. Right. In these bundles of wires, red and black power and ground, obviously. So we're stealing that off the radio right there, power and ground. That's all we got to hook up. The white and the brown for these X-series ones are for data logging. But we're not going to use them because we're just installing gauges. So we're literally just going to hook up those red and black wires. And uh, so we'll just cut these a little shorter. So we don't need all that. Probably cut them like there. You have a little extra slack just in case. It should be noted that you should never cut an entire bundle of wires like that if it's on the car or if it's hooked up to anything. I know that they're not hooked up to anything except for the sending unit, so I'm not that worried about it. But if you had power going to somewhere, your tool could actually short them. And then you're going to have a bad time. All right, so I am going to take the wires that I'm not going to use, which are going to be the white and the brown, and we're going to stagger them. And now they won't short against each other. Do the same thing on every single one of them. Just going to stagger them. See, now only the part that we actually need is showing. Yeah. So we'll do that a couple more times. This is the kind of thing I'm talking about. Like, you could just leave these wires hanging around in there. Some people do things like that. But it could short against stuff, and it's ugly. So why would you? But some people do it. Cleanliness is key comes to automotive electronics. Alright, so bring all these together. All three. And give them a good twist. Actually gonna put another female one on this side. Why am I doing that? Because we're gonna put a fuse here. I'll take the zip tie. 
tie it together really nice so it doesn't pull apart. Because if this gets strain on it, it's going to go the other way. So this will keep the fuse intact. You see, so you can pull like that, it doesn't matter. And that's how it would get pulled, if it was going to get pulled. Oops, I made a dagger. That's what you're not supposed to do. See, that could stab somebody. That's no good. And you want to tape over this, because these two pro points, I mean, they when it's on, those are going to be hot. So, you noticed, electrical tape is exactly the right size to fit right over that. Black wires, we're going to do the same thing, except we're just going to do a mail connector. Let's plug right in. Why go through the trouble? Well, say you're troubleshooting, and you're not sure if the radio or the gauges are causing a problem. These are on disconnects. You can just unplug the gauges. Take them completely out of the loop. This happens sometimes when you crimp them, and you gotta move that pin into the middle. And plug it in. And I'm gonna go ahead and zip tie that down as well. Now I just have to mount up the uh, gauge pod here to the A pillar, and it does come with these plastic Christmas tree clips, but I don't think I'm gonna use them just because I would prefer not to drill a bunch of holes in the A pillar if I can avoid it. Uh, so I think the best route is gonna be use good old fashioned 3M stick anything to anything tape. Just gotta clean it up real good with some glass cleaner, knock off Windex. And wipe it down every surface that the tape's gonna stick to, put the tape on, and then we're ready to go. So this stuff really will stick anything to anything, but just preparation is key. You really gotta make sure it's clean. If there is a hint of armor all on the panel you're using to stick to, it'll just fall right off. Even if it looks and feels clean and dry. Give it a good wiping down. And honestly, Windex is the best thing for that, or isopropyl alcohol. Anything stronger and you might melt the plastic or discolor it and you don't want to do that. So the whole point of this, using this instead of those stand or instead of those push clips, Christmas trees, whatever you want to call them, is that this is reversible. Like, it'll leave a residue, but you can get that residue off, you have to. You drill a hole, well, the panel's just gonna have a hole in it forever. And I truly believe Miata's are going to be considered a classic car eventually. It's just one of those cars that's kind of getting to that point. Even now, they're, they're sought after. So you want to hold that on there real tight for like 30 seconds. That is not going anywhere. It's that typical dad thing to say. That ain't going nowhere. And this is just friction fit. I mean, this isn't held in with any hardware on the back. So now that this is stuck on, if we had to get in here, or if I find out I didn't clip the thing in all the way, you know, it happens, uh, this can just come out and be fixed. I prefer that to drilling a bunch of unnecessary holes in the panel. Everything's mounted up and wired. All that's left to do is slap on a few zip ties under hood and check for leaks. Tie, zip it, tie, zip it, tie, game on fire. Zip it tie, zip it tie, zip it tie, yeah. Some nice, bright, white paper towels. I'll put them near all of our new stuff. If a leak happens, we will know. Let's open that. Let it have a little burp. They turn on. We have oil pressure. Have it. This thing is ready for the track.
Thanks for watching. See you next week. This program was brought to you in part by copious amounts of duct tape and zip ties. And of course, by financial contributions from viewers like you. Don't forget to click that subscribe button. Go ahead, click my face.